Hello, hello. And welcome again to a Beatles program called Things We Said Today. This is a weekly talk show podcast in which we talk about anything and everything Beatles. Any part of their past, the present, sometimes the future, whatever we feel like talking about in the moment. And I'm Ken Michaels, one of the four regular co-hosts of the show, also known for my uh, other Beatles program, a syndicated radio show called Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by my three other regulars. First of all, the writer for Beatles Examiner, the number one primo news source on the internet for Beatle fans, that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And we also have uh, the senior editor for Beatle Fan Magazine, who's been with them many, many years since uh, it, its inception, as a matter of fact, that being Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. Also, another writer for Beatle Fan and for many music publications, we have got Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hello, everyone. And let me click my mouse for my mouse friends here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Is this going to be an ongoing yeah. thing now? Well, you're, so you're, I haven't mentioned Life with the Lions in a while, so I, I needed uh, a new sort no, of you something. you haven't. Right. And now oh, I've got them both going. into one show. All right. Whatever turns you on at the a, moment, Alan. You need to have a Life with the Lions show. Hmm. Uh, I, that's 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 coming <laughs> at some point. Okay. okay. Anyway, on today's show, most of our conversation is going to be about the Wings Over America tour because uh, as we speak, we are celebrating its 40th anniversary uh, in America. And um, so we'll be talking about that. And uh, having uh, a bit of a conversation concerning an interview that Paul just did recently on BBC uh, television. And we'll talk about that, we'll mix that into the conversation. Before we do that, I just wanted to address one uh, email that we got sent from uh, David Goldsmith. And David lives in Auckland, New Zealand. And um, he just Yay, wanted to respond. We love New Zealand. Very strong Beatles, uh, Beatles fan base there. Um, so we wanted to respond to uh, the Bob Dylan uh, influenced, uh, the Beatles and Bob Dylan influence show. We mixed that also with the Beach Boys and Pet Sounds. And I was bringing up, because I couldn't remember what recording Bob Dylan released in which he's singing part of I Want to I Be Your Man. And so David let us know it is called I Want to Be Your Lover which is a 1965 outtake with the Hawks mm -hmm. that he first released on Biograph in 1985. And he says now it's in multiple iterations on the big blue box set, which Al mentions, actually Alan mentions Alan that mentions, he owns. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So along with that, David also wanted to thank, is actually me for mentioning the Finn brothers as uh, artists that, uh, I'd like to see Paul McCartney work with. We know the Finn brothers from uh, their work with Split Ends and Crowded House, and apparently the Finn brothers are are considered very iconic figures. And uh, according to David Goldsmith, this is in New Zealand, there's always comparisons made with Lennon McCartney, with uh, Neil and Tim. So David, just want to thank you for writing to us, and we always encourage our listeners to write to us for anything if you want to respond to one of our previous shows or have an idea for an upcoming show, feel free to write to us. So thank you, David. So our main topic is the Wings Over America tour, which, as I said, happened 40 years ago and uh, was one of the first concerts I ever attended. And I got to see Wings at Madison Square Garden. And still to this day, I consider it my favorite concert of all the concerts I've ever been to. Second time I ever saw a Beatle, because I saw George in 74. But it was a magical time back then. And sometimes when I think about that tour, I can't help but think about everything that surrounded it. And by that, I mean the radio airplay that McCartney was getting at the time with Wings. I mean, radio was saturated with Wings at that time on both AM and FM. So I think very fondly back to that time. And especially um, Al in particular, because... You know, you're in the New York metro area. You remember right. just as well as I do the kind of airplay that Paul was getting, uh, not only with the singles, with Silly Love Songs and Let Him In, but Wings at the Speed of Sound was the number one album around the time of the tour. 
Right. And um, so many other album tracks were being played by Wings. And that had been a buildup the previous years from, say, Band on the Run. Actually, Red Rose Speedway was the number one album. But mm -hmm. Band on the Run had several tracks played on the radio on both AM and sure. FM as rock radio was developing. And mm -hmm. same thing with Venus and Mars. And then that kind of culminated with Wings at the Speed of Sound because... I always remember so well, we, we had our rock station in New York at the time of WPLJ, which also played a lot of pop stuff too, mixed it together. But they would play a lot of album cuts like Time to Hide on the radio, Denny Lane song. And they played uh, She's My Baby and Beware My Love and Why No Junko uh, and those songs. So uh, that particular album got heavy airplay with so many different tracks and it was a great time for Paul McCartney. It was at the, you know, some people might call it the zenith of his career, certainly in terms of, of popularity, in terms of radio airplay. And depending on uh, whether you consider Wings the number one tour of the year, um, I'm not sure if Peter Frampton did better than Paul. I'm not quite sure. I certainly know Frampton Comes Alive was a blockbuster album. But, uh, you know, the Wings Over America tour was huge. And um, I loved seeing that show, and I missed the whole concept of Wings. And I also remember so well that, you know, there was a running joke at the time. Did you know Paul McCartney was in a band before Wings? And that's all because Wings was so popular, and it wasn't just the McCartney tracks, as I mentioned. So you had Denny Lane songs, you had Jimmy McCulloch songs being played on the radio. And uh, I remember all that at the same time as this tour. And then there's the performance of the tour, which I thought was amazing. And every time I look back on it and watch Rock Show, I'm just, you know, I wish I could go back to that time. You know, it's one of the few moments when I can actually say that because the performance of the band, they were really on fire when I look back at that particular tour. But I'm going to get my comments from each of you. And why don't we start with you, Al? It was like a victory lap for Paul because, of course, he took a lot of flack in the early 70s because of his perceived role in the in the Beatles breakup and and also because uh, you know he he took the the rap especially f uh, because of Ram and perhaps even more so Wildlife as being this lightweight you know uh, the this lightweight pop star and and indeed when the tour as the, t the tour was getting underway Silly Love Songs, which was his answer to those those very critics, became the number one song in uh, uh, in the U.S. And that harder rocking version of Silly Love Songs that they did uh, on Wings Over America was, uh, you know, it, that was. If you want to talk, if you wanted to call it a victory lap, you can very well, uh, very well do that. It was, um, uh, it was actually my first time seeing a Beatle because I, I never saw the Beatles live. I never, I didn't see the concert for Bangladesh or the the shows on the Dark Horse tour, or the uh, the one to one concert. So this was my first shot at seeing mm -hmm. a Beatle. And uh, I saw I saw the show three nights before you did, Ken. I saw the show at the Nassau Coliseum, uh -huh. out in your out in your old stomping grounds in Long Island, uh, and it was absolutely it's one of the the most amazing concerts to this day that I've that I've ever seen. And it was a, a, a you know a, it was really an emotional charge, you know, along with the fact that it was just a great rock and roll show. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a great arena concert. It was, you know, there was also that emotional element of seeing a Beatle for the first time, uh, especially uh, when they did the the acoustic set. You know, what uh, which was in those days that was kind of like a standard part of the rock concert was the kind of the mid mid concert acoustic set. What uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young called the wooden set when they mm. had their tour in 1970. And when Paul ended that set with Yesterday, I swear, well, if you've seen either Rock Show or Wings Over the World, you can see the shots of people in the audience with tears 
mm. streaming down their faces. And it took me all through uh, You Gave Me the Answer, which was the first song when Paul went back to the piano for the first song of the second half of the show. It took me all of that song to kind of get myself back together. <laughs> <laughs> That's how much of an emotional charge mm. uh, that, uh, that, you know, that concert you know that in that particular moment uh gave me and it is um it's 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 got to be still uh among probably my top five concerts of all time what did you think of wings as a band did you think it really worked as a band or did you go there thinking this is paul mccartney and four other people it's uh, i mean they obviously because of the fact that especially on um, on Venus and Mars and on Wings at the Speed of Sound, Paul went to great lengths to, to basically emphasize the band aspect of it with, with mm -hmm. Denny getting vocals and Jimmy McCullough getting his own songs and, uh, and, and even Joe English doing uh, Must Do Something About It. Right. On on wings at the speed of sound, uh, so so I knew that he was basically really trying to emphasize that there was a band, but still, it was really you know, I mean the ninety percent of the people that were there were going to see Paul McCartney. They weren't going to see Wings. Hmm. If you, okay, if you if you kind of get my drift there, I get your drift. <laughs> you know, I, when I listen when I listen to the albums, I think of them more as a band, especially when you're dealing with an album like Wings at the Speed of Sound, because mm -hmm. you have every single member of the group doing a lead vocal there. And how many bands can you say that about, you know, outside of the Beatles, you know, and uh, granted, he let Linda have Cook of the House there, but mm -hmm. all the other all the other members did a fine job with their songs. They held their own. And, and in particular, you mentioned Must Do Something About It, which is a, a real highlight for me. Sure. On Wings the Speed of Sound, Joe English has a, has a great singing voice, and I kind of mm -hmm. wish that that particular lineup you know, had continued, because if they had done anything with the same format for the next album, instead of Jimmy and Joe leaving, it, it would have been pretty interesting to see if he had kept up that same kind of idea mm -hmm. and really uh, let each person in the group have their moment, at least one song per album. But um, how about you, Alan? What do you think of that tour, and, and uh, where did you see Paul? Um, I didn't actually go that year. Um, really? Yeah, I think when he was in the New York area, I was still up in Syracuse where I went to school, and I don't think he got near there. But, okay, so I had already seen a couple of Beatles because I'd been to the concert for Bangladesh. And for me, this era of Wings was more of um, maybe, I don't see it as much as a victory lap as a kind of rehabilitation because of, you know, what Al said about Paul taking a, a lot of hits in the early 70s. I mean, I didn't really like a lot of his early 70s stuff and I my listening was going off in different directions and... Uh, um, at the time, and um, but he was beginning to put out some good stuff. I, I didn't like silly love songs much either, but um, apart from that, you know, I liked a lot of what he was doing, and it did interest me that I mean, I, I, I sort of caught up with some of the stuff that was going on in the New York area through tapes that people had. I mean, WNEW had an inter backstage interview with him at the garden. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so all of those things, start, you know, started circulating around pretty quickly afterwards. And so I got my hands on those and got to hear a bit of what was going on. And, um, you know, you saw things on TV and, um, but it really wasn't until the album came out and uh, and then later rock show that I was able to really catch up with, you know, a sense of what that experience was like. Although hearing you two talk about it, it obviously pales in comparison to actually being there, seeing it. Um, mm. <clears throat> yeah. But, you know, I mean, when I when I saw them, I mean, I, when I saw a rock show, I, I kind of thought, yeah, I kind of wish I had been at that um, because he really did cover a lot of what Wings' highlights had been up to that point, and a few Beatles songs, and uh, 
you know, it looked like it looked to me like a pretty tight band, although the whole question of whether Wings was a band was was really a little confusing and still is in a way. I mean, you know, you, you, you have a band with a name. When you have a band with a name, you kind of think, OK, it's a band. It's Wings. You know, it's not mm. just Paul McCartney. It's it's Wings. Um, mm. And it had some personnel changes, um, and obviously Paul was going to be the focal point. I mean, you know, there was no way he couldn't be. Even if it, even if he did get a super group together, you know, there's a, the question of Beatleness. You know, um, exactly. Well, um, you know, I, I wanted to just uh, well, let me counter that, okay? Because George Harrison was able to do it with the Traveling Wilburys. I mean, nobody would ever say that was George's group. Even though he was a Beatle. You know, you had five established superstars going into a band. Okay. Paul didn't do that. So, you know, if you've got much lesser known musicians, granted a lot of people, I'm sure, knew Denny Lane. Well, still, no matter what, Paul's going to be the king. Uh, okay, so you got all uh, those but, really great people in the Wilburys, but where do you file those albums? Mine are filed with George. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. It's I, okay. But I think the Wilburys, and, the Wilburys are a different situation because of who. I mean, you didn't have anybody honestly in Wings that ranked up with Dylan and or Orbison and right. you know. So that's what I'm right, saying. Right, because there was a per, and the, plus there was a in in the case of the Wilburys, it there was a personal connection there because of the fact that all of the other guys in the group were friends of George's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so there was so uh, you know, I'm not sure how many superstars of the time, quote unquote, were close enough to Paul. Yeah, well, you know, to... listen, you know, Kanye wasn't even probably born yet, so what can we say? This is true. But uh... I mean, he, he did talk in the in that master tapes interview that just came out about, you know, he had thought about contacting superstars, but I mean, yeah. It, it, that wouldn't have. I mean, it wouldn't have. It wouldn't have worked on. I mean, basically, what he wanted is a show. Was a showcase, and that's what Wings. Well, but really he also was. see this, a is, showcase this is part of the who? confusing thing because he also says sure. he wanted a band. He wanted a band to go back to the right. start and yeah. play at universities and you know and all of that. And yet, it still was going to be Paul McCartney and a bunch of yeah. other guys. I mean, the, the, right. the early Wings lineup. He was like, you know paying them a very low weekly wage. Um, I just listened to an interview mm -hmm. with um, Denny Sywell where, you know, he talks about how, you know, actually he had been making about 10 times what Paul paid him as a studio mm. musician in New York. I mean, it obviously was interesting to him to put that aside and go work with Paul and see what happens. But, um, you know, it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't like a band of equals, which is what a band more or less is, what we think of a band. Um, well, there's, there's more when you're talking about a band. There's more to it than how everyone gets paid. You know, if you're talking about in a creative capacity, if you go back to the earliest years of Wings and the early tours, mm -hmm. Denny Lane still got to sing Say You Don't Mind. Okay. Um, Henry McCulloch got to do one of his instrumentals. It wasn't like it was always Paul, always Paul with everything. Mm -hmm. And I have interviewed most of the members of Wings, mm -hmm. and they all have their own stories to tell. Right. But, you well, know, the, of course, in general... Of course they do. And, but, and know, one of but Henry McCulloch's just, was that, you know, he, was, he didn't like being always told what to play. And, you know, mm -hmm. in, in a band, there's yeah. more give and take. I mean, you know... Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. I think of them as a band when I listen to Wings Over America. I mean, it sounds like a band, but, but then, you know, his current band sounds like a band, too, but they don't really make any pretense of that being a band with, you know. Exa exactly. Um, you know, right. and those are, if, to me, I mean, those are great musicians, his current band. Uh, you know, there, mm -hmm. there, are, there are people who have some problems with one or the other of them, but, I mean, I think those those guys can play anything in Paul's catalog at the drop of a dime, and mm -hmm. I think it's very impressive. Wings, by comparison to the current group, I think was maybe a little bit ramshackle, but it was also a more ramshackle time, you know? I mean, it was a yeah, exactly. I mean, we're now in a very right. high-tech touring situation, whereas, you know, in Wings, I mean, they were, they were maybe a light year or two ahead of the Beatles in terms of touring facilities. 
I mean, can you imagine the Beatles trying to do "Live and Let Die" with a you know piano blowing up and, and the whole mm-hmm. thing? Yeah. You know. Mm-hmm. And also, the McCartney tour now is is charging a little more than uh, yeah, that's than true. what. Oh, well, they're charging a lot more. Uh, well, yeah, I I was kind of I was kind of being uh, you know. Yes, actually, they're but, charging about four times what each individual Wings member made per week in was, the first week <laughs> for a ticket. <laughs> so yeah, there we but go. there's there's a lot of differences uh, though between the Wings lineups and the current band. Sure. I mean, the current band really is basically his band for live shows. And if Paul feels like it, they could be on his studio albums. Mm-hmm. But with and Wings, have- whatever lineup you had on those albums, that's the band that went out on the road at the time. Right. So at least you have that to say. Right. And, um, you know, I just um, I, I respect the, the current band that he has and has had for the past 15 years or so. Mm-hmm. But there is a huge difference there between them and Wings. Yeah. And um, I do very seriously feel that Paul made a concerted effort for Wings to be looked at as a band. Mm -hmm. Because if you go back to that time, and it's even in uh, the DVD for the the deluxe Wings at the Speed of Sound, there's an interview there with all the members. Mm -hmm. You know, they all get a little bit of time. Something like that doesn't just happen. That's kind of planned and calculated. So, but, but, you know, but, for that to happen, that that means that Paul wanted Wings to be presented that way. I don't think that it was strictly a showcase for Paul's music. But again, that, that was a different time. Uh, that would not happen today because of the focus. Because, number one, Paul McCartney is a lot bigger now than he was then. Well, no, 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 we're talking, no, no. Well, we're talking about how it was then and what Paul was trying to do then. But he, I, I he's think not... He's not bigger now. He was he was bigger then. He had the number one single and album in the in the country this week forty years ago. He doesn't have the n- number one single no. and album now. No, but, but I you think know, his, he's his you know he makes he makes a lot of money as a concert um, mm-hmm. act, but he's not you know he's not uh, you know a big act you know in the way that you know the younger that some of the younger acts are. You know, oh, but, I, at I, that, I, but 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 at that at that moment in time, at that moment in time, forty years ago, he was you know he and Wings were were huge. Mm-hmm. I I I disagree on the status of McCartney then versus McCartney now because I, I agree that Wings. Well, were huge. he hasn't I, I had think... he he hasn't had a hit record, and he hasn't had a hit single, a top ten hit single, in thirty years. No, he I has not, he, not true. I understand that. I understand that, but I'm saying his status as a in the music world, I think, is uh, even though he hasn't had the hits, the fact that he's a Beatle, the fact that he's well, yeah, uh, but that's that. Yeah, in that but he interview with the greatest songwriter of all time, which which you can argue about, but I think I think there's more. I I think his status is a lot. I mean, he wasn't Sir Paul McCartney back then. He is now. I mean, I think there's there's some big differences between then and now. And um, so it's two, I, diff- I, it's two different things there. It's whether yeah. or not you're at, at the top of your popularity commercially, which right. is what Paul was really throughout. You know, most of the seventies. You know, and mm-hmm. even into the early eighties, he was still doing extremely well with his records and his singles. But you know, as time goes on, he becomes more and more of an iconic figure because of who he is. He just gets bigger and bigger through time. Yeah. And another big difference is that back then, he wasn't relying on the Beatles catalog to carry him in these shows. He only did right. five Beatles songs in the entire set list. And Nowadays, that was a yeah, and now it's more like 60% of his catalog is Beatles, and that's another issue that we'll get to. But the difference is, back then, he was selling his current catalog and his recent catalog. Today, mm-hmm. Paul McCartney is selling Paul McCartney yeah. and the name. Well, that's, that's and, true, too. And, and, it's, and actually, it's actually funny, if you watch Rock Show, how casually he does yesterday, whereas now he would he's not really... I mean, what he does yesterday now, it's he he's very serious. I mean, but he kind of just kind of slept through it you know, on rock show well so. actually now he kind of goes he, he kind of does yesterday now as if he's on autopilot in fact he's mm-hmm. even he's even said 
that you know probably that you know if if you know if he was able to he might want to retire certain certain songs and probably yesterday is one of them because he's just done them so you know so many times now but you know back then it was like you know it was uh, it was actually you know on that tour that was the first time he had performed that song since the 60 the the 66 Beatles tour or well, mm-hmm. no, and also the James Paul McCartney uh, special. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, well, some so of the introductions, some of the so introductions it, in are just extremely casual. It's like, uh, okay, you can tap dance to this one now, or some, you know, something like that. Oh then, yeah, well, yeah, well, that that's a difference because I was thinking of that because you know he he in those and of course actually in those days that was the way rock concerts were acts mm-hmm. generally didn't really talk that much other than say Bruce Springsteen or somebody like that he and talented. he actually and yeah exactly and 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 Paul really talked very little during most of those shows it was basically you know like how you doing or like you say and you can you know shake your bum to this one that sort of thing right. it didn't do all the the stuff that he does if you want to call it that if you want to call it shtick shtick that he does now with taking off the code and let yeah. me soak in all of this yeah. and tell right. the Jimi oh, hendrix yeah. story oh, and oh, yeah. all of that you know yeah. so oh, it's God. it's a very different Although speaking of that, you know, there's right. so I listened to the the deluxe um, box set this weekend mm-hmm. and, and and the San Francisco stuff, which I I really enjoyed. Um, I wish he would put out more archival stuff. Um, and at the very beginning of that, he welcomes the audience to San Francisco, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, those people already <laughs> were in San Francisco. <laughs> He's just getting mm-hmm. to San Francisco, so I just thought that was a lot. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. but yeah, you're right. You know, he doesn't talk that much. I mean, he talks about the rhythm box and uh, you know a little. Mm-hmm. I, I I hadn't actually missed the talking, um, even though he talks a lot more now. I mean, it, it, I, there, there's a little bit of interaction. Maybe it's because, as you say, that's how shows were, and it just seemed yeah. natural to me. But um, mm-hmm. yeah. But, you know, just to go a little bit further on what I w- was just saying about when Paul tours now, he's he's basically selling Paul McCartney and a word that you love very dearly, Steve, the brand. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> one thing that, that uh, you and I have talked about, Steve, before Al and Alan joined the show, and this is something that is not just with Paul and with Ringo, but it's common nowadays with a lot of acts that go out on tour – you can't buy their CD at the show. <laughs> you can't mm-hmm. buy Paul McCartney's new at one of his mm. shows. You can't buy Ringo's postcards from paradise. They're not necessarily selling their new CD, even though they're playing something from it, but you mm-hmm. can buy t-shirts and you can buy keychains and you can buy hoodies. You know, there's more money in that. And that's what, that's what they're selling there. They're not necessarily, you know, selling their latest album, even if they're playing something from it. That's not the main purpose why you're going to see them now. You're going to see mm-hmm. a legend and songs spanning their entire careers. And so back then, and, and, you know, oh, back then ahead. Paul had Paul had something to prove back then to build himself up, like he did. Gradually, the album started to sell more and more and more. Mm-hmm. And yep. from Red Rose Speedway, which went to number one, through Wings Over America, all those albums, Band on the Run, Venus and Mars, Speed of Sound, Wings Over America, they all hit number one. It was mm-hmm. this gradual climb. So um, it was just great to witness that. And, um, you know, apart from that, the, the show itself was an amazing show. <laughs> Interesting. and, uh, Interestingly enough, uh, Brian, uh, he, they were, he was allowing Brian to sell his CDs on past tours, but I did not see his CDs this time. So that's Brian, interesting. Brian, Brian Ray you're talking about. Brian Ray, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. yeah. And I do recall but, when, when you and I talked about this, Steve, a lot of the songs from, say, Ben on the Run through Speed of Sound worked so much better as live performances than studio mm-hmm. recordings. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I think for that reason, that's one of the reasons why that tour worked so well. Still mm-hmm. to this day, my favorite recordings of certain songs like Letting Go, you know, that it's a live version you got to listen to, more so than the studio. Not sure. that I don't love the studio. Yeah. But, uh, well, I mean, I, 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 I really, I mean, I thought the... You know, I, I watched Rock Show again, and I mean, I think I think that tour is great. I, I do, 
you know, but as as we've been saying, it, it was kind of a haphazard thing. I mean, it's kind of thrown together. And, and I was actually, and I actually did some comparisons, and I was going to throw a question out to you guys. Is do you think Wings Over America is his best tour? Yes. <laughs> Alan? Mm, gosh. It's hard to say. I mean, it, it, yeah. it, it has that cachet of, first of all, being, you know, really the biggest wings tour and a live album came from it and and there's all of that but you know i don't know i think i think the tours he did in 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 between 89 and yes. maybe 89 and five new you know, world 2005 new was world beginning to yeah 93 was really good yeah, I, I don't know. I think some of those tours may have been better in terms of the playing and and the set list. And uh, but, but I, was, I don't know. But the Wings Over America is it 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 sort of stands by itself in a way. No, and I, I agree. It does. I, I was one of my favorites, though. Believe it or not, is Space Within Us. That is that DVD, especially mm. the Blu-ray version, which is really an incredible, uh, really stunning, and it sounds fantastic. And uh, one of the songs that really caught my—I didn't—I I reviewed. I, I kind of scanned through both of them, you know, to prepare for this. And one of the songs that blew me over that would be great for him to do again would be "Flaming Pie." That really sounded good on on Space Within Us. Uh, I couldn't believe it. Mm. Um, Except he did that. He uh, did that for a long time. Yeah. Right. Uh, it I sounds, think he. Just it, the way it starts, and especially the sound mix on that DVD is wonderful. And yeah. I don't know if it's just the Blu-ray, but the the Blu-ray is, is the picture is so good, and the the sound mix on that thing is great. And um, I've recommended that before as mm. probably one of my favorite. A couple of years ago, I think I said that was my favorite Beatles Blu-ray. I mean, we've had a, we've had a couple since then, but uh, that one is just fantastic it really is hey steve you, but, you said yeah, that but, the wings over america tour you called haphazard i'd like well to yeah that. yeah what uh, <laughs> yeah. oh boy uh, i didn't want that to um, go unnoticed here <laughs> yeah. yeah well is it i mean it was the way i mean the way things were back then you know it wasn't as organized as it was i mean it was a fam as we know it was a very much a family affair it was there seemed to be a, somewhat of a casual spirit to it all. Yeah, but that was, was kind of, that was the seventies. You know, it was right. it wasn't as it, I, you know everything wasn't as corporate as it is now. I, you know, I, with eight million I, sponsors and all that sort of thing. Came from is is that? I mean, it's you know, it's actually hard to believe that Paul McCartney could could do a tour like that, especially in light of of what uh, um, you know, the way his tours are now. I mean, I, I, I said, you know, watching Brian Ray and 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 Rusty and 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 everybody, you know, on some of the recent tours has been fantastic. I mean, they're they're a wonderful band, and you know, but uh, I, yeah, I mean, it's just it's amazing what what he, the evolution that he's gone through as far as you know touring goes. But but that you know like Wings Over America was hardly haphazard. I mean yeah. that that was really the the culmination of a whole you know you know really what began with the if you want to call the you know kind of the bus tour that they did in '72 in right. Europe that was a little haphazard. But yeah. by '76. Uh, I that think was I, a, I, I really meant more somewhat casual. Yeah, not have yeah, that. that was really more of a you know that was more of a an operation, much right. more of an operation. Yeah. It wasn't again, it wasn't as corporate as things are now, but it was. I mean, you know, watch watch Wings Over the World, and you can see how you know how big a mm -hmm. uh, an enterprise that you know that really was in '76, oh, yeah. and it was a, you know an exactly. You know that the timing could not have been more perfect because mm. it was really just as he had completely kind of rehabilitated his popularity. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, this week, probably as you know, somewhat of a reaction to the success of Wings Over America, Capital released "Got to Get You Into My Life." 
as the an advanced single from the rock and roll music compilation, and that became a top ten record. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the Wings Over America tour is very organized. Yes. Extremely organized. Paul has always been that way. Well, except for, like you were saying, Al, the very beginning, the early tours. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. And for, for me, because his catalog is so huge at this point, it's just disappointing to me that he relies too much on the Beatles stuff. I mean, I, if it was, if I had my way, I wouldn't want five Beatles songs like he did in 76, but... You know, when you consider the fact that his career has spanned now over 50 years, if it was me, I'd say one third Beatles should be in his show. So, but now it's it's just so it's it's very heavy on the Beatles stuff, and it's been that way since eighty nine ninety, which I think right. he was doing because of a reaction because he always wanted to do those songs. He held off doing it, yeah, because he really had to prove himself. No, 70s. I think he ha- I think he has to do the, the group stuff more now. I, I don't think there's any question about that. I don't think he could get away with two thirds solo. I really don't. Well, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, I mean there, well, there, that depends. That depends. <laughs> there are certain songs that he absolutely has to do. I mean, he has to do. He has to do yesterday. He has to do Hey Jude. He has to do Let It Be. He has to do. He pretty much has to do Long and Winding Road. And uh, I think uh, I this, think you can live without that one, but me too. That's just, well, the thing is, not. well, yeah, you 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 can do live without it, but the person who's going to see he, see him for the first time, and this is what he constantly talks about. In fact, he talks about it in this this interview from last week. The person that's going to see him for the first time, if he doesn't do, let it be. You know, that person is going to be very disappointed. I agree about let it be, but I don't. I don't think a long and winding road follows in the same track. Well, I really, I, 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 I don't I, agree with you, Steve. I think that's that song is is one of his greatest songs ever. A long exactly. and winding road. Yeah, I keep um, thinking of the Spectre, uh, the Phil Spectre choir in the background. I've never had a problem with that. Neither have I. Really? Yeah, going back to when it was first released in '70. Um, you know, I thought, in fact, uh, I forget whether it was Spectre or somebody else said that they felt that it was, you know, that it was an absolute, you know, since at that point, the feeling was that that was going to be the last Beatles record released mm-hmm. in America. It was almost as if it was like the perfect uh, punctuation mark on their career. Hmm. You know, you know, and that's so, something that we've said here. And I think, Al, you brought it up. Mm-hmm. So many people complain about the long and winding road, and Phil Spector destroyed it, and all that. Nobody complains about Good Night, <laughs> yeah. You know, and uh, you know George Martin did the orchestration for that. That was heavy right. orchestration on that song. Yeah, but a bit, of, but if John was touring as much as Paul's touring, you wouldn't see Good Night every single time he goes out on tour. Um, you probably would see it like never. But that has nothing to do with whether or not. We'll yeah. Be like or not. Well, you know, <laughs> you don't see Paul Ringo playing tonight. No, that's the that's the only he doesn't do slow songs, if you notice. Mm-hmm. He never does. He never does only you. That's the only. Right, he's never done only 10. you, and that was a yeah. Top ten. That's the only top ten single he's had yeah. in the U.S. that he's never done live. He stays right. away from the ballady stuff. Yeah, you know. So, uh, yeah, but um, Maybe you should try it. Anyway, we are just uh, alluding to an interview that Paul McCartney just gave on yes. BBC television. Uh, it was at Maida Vale Studios, and um, John Wilson was the host of the show. It's called Master Tapes. And um, I would highly recommend, I, I actually enjoyed this interview. Um, you can watch it, at least the last time I checked Paul McCartney's website, you can actually bring it up, although it's not the complete interview. But he talks about a variety of subjects, which we're going to tackle here uh, on the show. And actually, since we were just discussing this whole idea about Paul and the material that he does live, it was brought up to him. In the audience, Paul Weller was there. Uh, right. Paul Weller from the Jam and, and the Style Council. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he was saying to Paul, does it bother you at all that a lot of people seem to want to only hear the Beatles stuff and not as much the solo music? And Paul did say, yes, it does bother me. And then the, the host, John Wilson, said to Paul, to Paul Weller, because um, you, meaning Paul Weller, you don't 
uh, play all your old jam and style council stuff. And then Paul Weller, very interestingly, said um, that that's why I'm not playing stadiums. <laughs> you know? So, um, you know, the, the thing is, when Paul says this, it really bothers me because he's in total control as to what he does live. He decides whether he's going to play stadiums, whether he's going to play smaller venues. That's up to him. He can play solo music if he wants to, if he does either. He has to alert the fans before the tour that that's what he's going to do, if he mm -hmm. wants it to be all solo or mainly solo, or he plays smaller venues where he's mm -hmm. going to sell out. You know, that's up to him. He's the one that's choosing to play big venues like stadiums or 20,000 seat arenas. He's the one doing that. And he knows that if he's going to play big audiences like that, for that kind of an audience, you got to do Yesterday and Hey Jude and Let It Be and Live and Let Die and those songs. Exactly. But he determines himself. It's all in his, it's his decision. You know, Paul doesn't control what radio stations play, but he mm -hmm. sure can control what he does. So for him to complain about it, you know, I can't really sympathize with him. He's the one, he's in the, the driver's seat here. Mm hmm yeah, I don't know. He seemed to he seemed to say that he he might play things uh, on certain nights because he wants to play them. I mean, that's one of the things he said in that interview. So yeah, I think he gets a kick out of um, reviving some old Beatles song that he's never played since they did it. You know, and, uh, mm. and you, you, you get that impression, right. you know, from his introduction sometimes. You know, getting better or you know whatever when he revived that. It it um. You know, and, and I think those things are always the surprising things that people talk about. I mean, this year, Hard Day's Night. I don't I don't think it's that great a version of Hard Day's Night, frankly. I've heard it now from a number yeah. of cities, and it's kind of tepid. But the idea mm -hmm. of him doing Hard Day's Night, I thought, was kind of interesting, you know? And to open his concert with it. Yeah. That's a great opening song, too. Yeah. Mm. I think he... Um, he may on some level recognize, I know Ken is going to not agree, but that this catalog is actually the best stuff that he is was involved in writing. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, look, Dylan, Dylan I, says I the same thing, too. Feels, <laughs> and I don't know if Paul will ever fully admit it. Um, I don't know. I think he's alluded to that over the years. Yeah. He's He kind of... He, he he kind of uh, intimates that he feels that his prime writing was the Beatles catalog and not and not the the post Beatles. You know, even though there's I mean there's great stuff. Obviously, in forty six years, sure. he's done he's done a lot of great music, but I think he he feels that it's the that the that the Beatles catalog. Especially his songs are are something are something special. You know what I'd like well, to see him I, do that I think could be a really good compromise. You could play a bunch of Beatles songs and play a bunch of Wings and catalog songs, but the guy does a mm -hmm. show that is nearly three hours long. He could take yeah. forty five minutes and do one of his albums start to finish, one of his solo albums. I think that mm -hmm. would be really That's interesting to see. Yeah, and I, think, he's, on it, I think he's he's been asked about that. And, uh, and he, he said no, he wouldn't do it. Right. Yeah. He, he dismissed the idea, which I, I agree. I think it would be nice too. And it'd, well, be, it'd be. I think to him, if you do something like that, it's very predictable what you're going to hear from song to song. I think he likes surprising people, even though so many of the fans know what he's going to do anyway of when course. they go to the show. Yeah. But, um, but, but, but what happens is he take he, you end up getting deep cuts that you don't necessarily that you don't hear very often. Um, right. I mean, I mean, Bruce Springsteen has been out right. for much of this year doing a two disc set, you know, that he released in 1980 called The River, which is, you know, maybe one of the two or three finest albums he ever released. But it is a two a two record set. And so that's so there's a lot of music in there. And and that's you know, and that takes up probably two thirds of his of his show right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, just going just going through some of the, the past McCartney DVDs, I listened to him do Fine Line. I listened to to him do um, Sergeant Pepper. 
um, Jenny Wren. I mean, and I know, Ken, you've talked about Jenny Wren before. Just the fact that he hasn't, you know, that he doesn't do stuff like that very often to revive it would be a you know a great would be would be fun you know i think what he's af- I, I think what he's that. afraid of i think what he's afraid of is that i think he's gotten too used to to digging himself into a into a you know into a kind of a ditch where he just doesn't want to it's it's almost like what ringo's doing is just doing the same stuff every night in fact i notice now he's only changing one song a night it used to be more than it used to be two or three. It's not even that anymore. So, you know, it's really gotten to the point where he's just making very few changes now. Yeah, well, there's one thing I wanted to bring up here because Paul has commented that he notices when he does certain solo songs yeah. that people either get up and go to the bathroom then, right? Or what was the how was it phrased in this interview that their tablets black, went black or a black black hole. You know, yeah. that he mentioned that you know, when he when the Beatles songs are playing, you know, you can see all of the, uh, you know, the, the iPhones all over yeah. the stadium. But then when uh, when he does one of the, you know, the lesser known songs, yeah. uh, it's, uh, you know, as he called it, a black hole. <laughs> well, what Paul doesn't seem to understand is if it gets that kind of a reaction, it doesn't necessarily mean that the whole audience hates the song mm-hmm. or doesn't like the song it has more to do with they're not familiar with it <laughs> so if you're going to see any artist perform on stage and you need to go to the bathroom are you going to go during a song that you know and love or are you going to go during a song that you don't know at all yeah. so i think he's, oh, I, I, he's I, very I he reacts to that i think there are very few songs mccartney songs that people don't know i think i think he's basically Put himself on that hill by by relying so heavily on Beatles songs. If oh, you, I agree. If you, yeah. if you take if you stop relying on Beatles songs in the set and put a few more solo songs, then people are gonna. Not only will people, I, I, I shouldn't say people will know them more because they they know them now, you know. But it'd be, I think it would it would help him that much more, you know, and it would also make the you know. Make the uh, uh, the uh, interest in it. It, it may it would. I mean, the, the spoilers um, in the sets. Um, we all know. We basically know what he's doing on this tour. Oh, you of know, course. like it's, he's only changing one or two. One it looks like right now it's only one song a night. You know, I mean yeah. that's. Well, well, some of his tours, he never changed anything at all. I mean, in 93, yeah. I don't think even in 89, there oh, were yeah. very For few years, changes. He did exactly the same show. You know, every with the every same night, pattern he too. Didn't change he didn't change a show. You know, change a a set list for the entire tour. That's you right. would think, for the sake of the musicians, he would do he would do that, because I would think the musicians, having not played a concert myself as a musician, but I would think that the musicians and well, I mean, look what the Rolling Stones are doing. The you know they're varying their songs on their tour. Although I I don't know. How, how many songs that they're they're adding in? I mean, they were doing. Didn't they do a one tour where they were getting internet votes on on songs? It seemed to me they mm. they did. They were taking they were taking internet votes on on adding certain songs. I mean, I agree that there's the Stones are the same in the same. Yeah, I mean, that's a different thing. And and again. Sorry to bring up Bruce Springsteen again, but you know there is uh, this portion of the of the standard Springsteen show where he'll see people bringing up bringing cards, you know, bringing placards into into the stadium requesting a certain song, and he'll like you know have you know have his people like. Uh, take those placards and bring them on stage, and you know, he'll basically it's almost like stump the band, and <laughs> you know, uh, you know, because they're and because they, a lot of times they're not just Springsteen songs, but they're old, you know, '60s pop and soul and rock. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, classics, you know that kind mm-hmm. of thing. So it's uh, so it's you know it's it's very different. But you know it's like Ken was saying before, the fact that he that Paul chooses to play these large venues that he plays stadiums, and he knows that the the crowd that he's going to draw for these stadium shows, they want Beatles songs. 
mm-hmm. you know, then all well, that goes without saying. You know, that's that's, that's what they want, and that's why the va- you know that's why the the percentage of Beatles songs has done nothing but increase since you know going all the way back as Alan mentioned to eighty nine ninety. Mm-hmm. You know, he's it's, he's the one who's put himself. In yeah, the- exactly. You know, and we were just talking about how Paul rarely changes the set list. Look at the Wings Over America tour, with the exception of when it really started in um, in Australia, actually mm-hmm. at the end of uh, '75, and he didn't have the speed of sound material. Right. Once he once he played in America, every show was almost the same, except mm-hmm. some shows ended with high, 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 and some shows ended with soily, and that yeah. was the only difference. Mm-hmm. Right. The entire tour. So he was that way then. He's pretty much the same way now. He only has made a few changes here and there. In the last few years, I've been surprised that if you go to two shows in a row, there might be two different songs that he flip-flops. But, you know, for the most part, it's it's pretty much the same. But I also want to just go back to a comment that we were just you know, talking about here about Paul and what he thinks of his material and, and whether or not his Beatles stuff is his strongest. If it's one thing Paul has done is to avoid assessing his career. Anytime somebody has ever asked him, what's your best album? He'll always say, mm. uh, that's, that's not for me to decide. That's for you guys to decide. It's like a cop-out for him. He'll never really, truly tell you. He'll say he likes the first album, the first McCartney album. Mm. He'll call it a funky album. You know? And he'll remember you know, all the, the emotion that went on and the turmoil in his life and how he had to turn his life around during the McCartney album and all that. But he doesn't really take a look at his entire solo catalog and tell you, well, you know, I think Tug of War is my best album. Mm -hmm. Or I think Flowers in the Dirt is my best. You'll never hear Paul ever talk about that. You Mm -hmm. know that he has enormous pride in the Beatles. But I've never heard him say, well, you know, my Beatles stuff is definitely my best. Because some, maybe privately, he, he feels that there are certain albums of his or certain songs of his that just haven't been recognized. And he's too afraid to even say anything about it. You don't know, really. Hmm. That's why I wish, although it probably would never happen, I'd like to see Paul just give a concert and do whatever he wants and not care what the audience wants. Just what's in his heart at the moment. Yeah, that's just not him. But Mm. you don't really know how Paul feels about his his entire career. Remember we were commenting about wildlife, and in one interview recently he said it was the worst album he ever made? Mm. And then you go back to the McCartney interview that came out in 1980 on vinyl, that album, that interview with Paul Gambaccini. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He was remembering how somebody he saw driving by, rolled down the window and showed wildlife and said, best album you ever made, man. <laughs> you know, so he's bringing that up to show that other people have different opinions and, you know, everybody's opinions need to be recognized. I think it's, I think I disagree with you that he doesn't know. I think he, I think he knows darn well that the Beatles stuff is the best stuff he's ever done. Look at how much he talks about it. Well, he I, talks I mean, about it because everybody asks some questions about the Beatles. If his interviews were more controlled, then maybe he'd talk about other stuff. <laughs> if his oh, interviews were more controlled, oh, I don't. I, oh, I can't I heard, imagine anyone giving more controlled interviews than he does. Yeah, yeah, right. And Alan would Alan would know better than uh, certainly better better than any of the four of us. Then how is he bombarded exception. with so many Beatles questions, and he allows it? Yeah, well, he is, but but um, you know what he he, he even on says that. he loves talking about the Beatles now. Right. So he's inviting it. Yeah, you know it's it's funny. Um, it's very hard to because he's been asked so much. It's really hard to ask him stuff that is not going to elicit the same group of answers. And uh, in in one, I know of one recent interview when when he did his ballet, um, and he was interviewed uh, for the Times by Dan Waken, and it was kind of interesting because Dan asked him something specifically about the ballet and what you know, what sort of subplots were going on in it or, you know, things like that. And, and he said, um, I, I'm sorry, I haven't prepared an answer for that. <laughs> you know, mm. and I wow. kind of, you know, when I, when I interviewed him in 1990, I, I, I worked really hard to not ask the same questions. I mean, I wanted to get out of that room without him telling me he dreamed yesterday. And, right. <laughs> and I did it. And, you know, and I thought we had a really interesting talk um, with, you know, some stuff that he hasn't talked about in other 
other interviews just just because the the way the discussion went and he answered them you know off the cuff and i mm -hmm. thought that was great you know but now it's down to first of all interviews now with the exception of things like this this uh, bbc interview um which in its full version runs about an hour now he when you want to do an interview with him it's 20 minutes and it doesn't really matter what venue you're writing for and from my point of view 20 minutes is an announcement it's not an interview really um, mm -hmm. and you run into things where if you deviate from the questions he expects he's not going to wing it <laughs> as they say um, he's he's going to tell you he doesn't have an answer prepared which is very weird not only mm -hmm. that it was you know he didn't have an answer prepared about the ballet that he was being interviewed about. I, I didn't really understand mm. that. Um, the only one thing I, I, I did say, you know, when I was standing there when Dan was interviewing him and, um, and I said to the person at the desk in front of him, I said, you know, he's going to tell Dan that the New York Times panned Sergeant Pepper, which is only partially true, by the way. And Dan got off the phone and I said, so um, did he tell you that the New York Times banned Sergeant Pepper? And he said, he did. <laughs> that was a surprise. <laughs> and he said, but, and then that's when he, he told me about the, you know, I haven't prepared an answer for that because he'd never run into someone who had said that as an answer. So, yeah, his interviews are real controlled. That was the point, you know, if we've sort of um, gone astray a bit. But, you know, another thing we wanted, we were all talking about before, um, uh, with that BBC interview was the, you know, the big headline that has been out there is that he says supposedly in this interview that Wings was terrible. And, you know, you all heard the interview. He didn't really say that, right? No, he did. That was, that was an off the cuff. Yeah, I, I never, yeah, I, ne I never <laughs> heard those three words no. in the, uh, in the, mean, in the interview. He was talking well, he did about say, when they first he, got I together. It was great. Just what he said. Yeah, and that's where people expanded. The, uh, people expanded that comment to say, you know, stretched it out and made it. You know, wings were terrible. No, 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 no. That's not what he. Yeah. I mean, he was basically saying, like, uh, they were thrown together, which is what well, you know we've all said. And he said we weren't so. very good, but he's talking about <laughs> a really, really specific period at the very beginning of Wings. Yeah, they had like three <laughs> rehearsals and went out and you know played at colleges, you know, okay. Mm -hmm. you know, they weren't great. I mean, we've all heard the tapes, um, sure. but, but they were fun. You know, they were energetic. It wasn't a bad band. And certainly by the time you get to the album we've been discussing, you can't say that he would have thought that was a terrible band or, or really anybody would have. It's, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of crazy, but it's like, you know, this is what I was... You know, I'm sure Steve feels the same way. I mean, we spent our lives as journalists and to see, you know, that journalism has gotten to the level where you can take <laughs> a quote like that in mm -hmm. the context he gave it and turn it into a headline in respectable newspapers, British ones. Um, so Paul says Wings was terrible. You know, it's... Well, if we're saying the... Are we saying the Daily Mail is a respectable no, newspaper? I thought it was like in the Telegraph, wasn't it? Did they tell it? No, I thought... I, well, was, I it thought the it was, was it the Telegraph or the Guardian? Or the Guardian. It was one of those I two. think it was I the... Think and the, the, and the Guardian has had has their own troubles these days. Yeah. You know, with a new, uh, you know, a new owner and a new editor and, and all. But, uh, you know, so it's possible that they're kind of uh, going the way of, uh, you know, the Fleet Street, uh, you know tabloid papers yeah i know. don't know when i was a kid and probably when steve was a kid the idea that you were supposed to sort of write something that would illustrate the reality you know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sure it's 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 getting really it's getting really ridiculous now mm -hmm. i mean the way stories have, have been pulled out of i mean and not just mccartney i mean it's it's everybody, you know, and it's right. it's crazy. And and when when we see when when I see stories like this, you know, Wings were a horrible band. You know, I, I just kind of, you know, go, oh my god, please, you know. And I, it, you almost know, it, it, it. What what really gets people's attention is the element of surprise. 
If it's something that they haven't heard before, they don't give a damn if it's true. And especially, this is especially true in politics, you know, if it's somebody they think they agree with or they, you know, I mean, they'll pull, I mean, look at, look at the current, but if I can go off on politics a little bit, look at the current political ca campaign, the way things are getting tossed around about, about the two candidates, one in particular who I won't, I won't be partisan, but I, those of you that know me know who I'm talking about. It's ridiculous. It's crazy. It's stupid. And, and that's what has happened. And that's the way. Okay. Ridiculous, crazy, and stupid. Give me an idea who you're talking <laughs> <laughs> Let's All see. Right. How about if I say orange? Does that does that give you okay? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So. But I, I mean, yes. You know, it's just, it's silly. I mean, and and the way it, you know, not only with politics, but it's you know, celebrity news is just is is stupid. I mean, yeah. You know, I almost feel. I think I I actually mentioned this to Patty Boyd when I talked to her. I said, you know, I asked her. I you know, we were talking casually, and I said, you know, how do you guys feel about all of these crazy stories? And she goes, God, it's ridiculous. You know, and it it really is. You, you almost have to feel sorry for celebrity. I don't know, if, Alan, if if you do, but in a way, I do feel kind of sorry for some of the stories that come out that get reported. It's stupid. Yeah, I think so too. Well, the media jumps on anything that's outrageous. That said, right. it's only but, done to get ratings, you know, to get people talking about it, to bring in mm -hmm. more ratings. It's 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 more about making money. And especially in this case, there was nothing outrageous. He didn't say anything outrageous. It, they, it just no. sort of oh, in this case, meetings. he didn't. No. Unfortunately, when I've seen the response to this on Facebook and I've read some of the threads, some people are smart enough to realize this was taken out of context. Yeah. And then there are other people Any. who are stupid who would say, "Yeah, Wings really was terrible." You know, you know, this is no you know, my was... my my pet peeve is you know social media, you know, mm -hmm. and the way you know the the um, the amount of stupidity that is out there on social media, you know, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, whatever, you know, there is so much, you know, there should be, I don't know, I think I, there should be an intelligence exam for anybody who you know, who wants to uh, register with one of these sites because uh, there's an awful lot of stupidity out there and it's dangerous stupidity, especially mm -hmm. all these people that, you know, have been getting into, uh, have been, you know, throwing around politics and people that are, you know, that, uh, you know, that go on there and bully, uh, bully their schoolmates and all this stuff, you know, it's, uh, you know, something, something eventually has got to be done, you know, and in fact, from that same interview with Paul, the other sort of newsy nugget was about you know his defense of of Kanye West and about you know especially the the all day song and mm -hmm. um, his you know labeling Oprah as being more conservative uh, and all and I saw some of the reaction on you know again on on facebook and i mean these people are just they're clueless they're absolutely mm -hmm. clueless they have they don't have you know if if they have a brain in their head they they've never used it you know it's you know and they just you know they just get on there to spew hot air mm -hmm. and, you know it's uh, it's it's absolutely ridiculous Good, end good. of rant end of rant <laughs> We've had our ultimate moment for this episode. Yes, <laughs> that's true. But I wanted to touch upon a couple of things here because one of the things that I found interesting about the interview, watching it, and again, it's it's a different it's a different experience to me watching this interview than mm -hmm. just listening to it because he did bring up the Beatle breakup and how difficult it was for him at the time, not just for the breakup, but for him to actually sue the other Beatles in order to free himself from Alan Klein. And um, the thing is that when you actually watch this interview, and by the way, Paul doesn't have much makeup on, if any, and he really looks <laughs> a lot older here. Yeah. And I'm very, very concerned about his voice, even his speaking yeah. voice, which has been hoarse for years. Mm -hmm. And even mm -hmm. when he attempts to try and sing something here, 
Yeah. It's really not that good. No. And it takes a lot for me to say that, by the way. Mm-hmm. But when he talks <laughs> about the um when it when he talks about the Beatle breakup here, you can tell it still gets to him. It's still mm-hmm. a very emotional thing. It's like it still torments him, this whole thing that he had to sue the other Beatles. And you can see it in his face. And this is the kind of thing that if you just listen to the audio, you probably won't pick up at all. But I found that to be really interesting. It's so many years later. But, you know, this is so much a part of his life and how it turned out. And it was such a, you know, a a turning event in his life. And it still is something that he has difficulty wrestling with. You know, that whole episode of having to sue the other Beatles. And it just goes to show you how how human he is. Yeah, by the way... um, since we're pointing people to videos on the internet, um, I ran into one just the other day that was a 1973 interview that John Lennon gave in LA, I think for a program called Weekend or Weekday or who knows, something like that. I mean, very easy to find on YouTube where he had just freed himself from Alan Klein. And in Mm. this interview, he says, you know, Paul might have been right. (laughs) <laughs> he just mm-hmm. says, uses those words. Hmm. Paul might have been right yeah. about Klein. So. Yeah. And and as a matter of fact, uh, even as we've been talking, I just happened to, just popped up in my email was the monthly Paul McCartney, what's that you're doing, e-newsletter, if you want to call it that. And in fact, in there is a link to the BBC interview, mm. the video version. Mm-hmm. Okay, Mm -hmm. so I would recommend everyone to watch it because I still found Mm -hmm. it interesting, even though it's territory that he's that we've we've heard before. Not everyone's heard these same stories. You can't just assume we all have heard them, but um, it still is an interesting interview. He tackles a lot of ground in here. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there was some new stuff. The new the new stuff about Kanye actually. Yeah, and and, and Rihanna working how those tracks were made. That was something I hadn't heard about yeah. before. And, uh, that, yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. I didn't know the, about the fact that they had, you know, sped up his, sped up his voice particularly. Right. That you was, know? yeah, that was, that was interesting. And because uh, everybody wondered what, where he was in there and nobody, and nobody figured that out as I recall. Yeah. I thought that was yeah, interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Here's a quote. I actually have the quote from Paul about Kanye, about all day. He said, it's a great record. Sonically, it's brilliant. But quite a few people said, you can't be connected to this. There's like 40 N-words. And then he says, I love Kanye and he loves me. He's a monster. He's a crazy guy who comes up with great stuff. So he inspires me. Hmm. So I think this just shows that Paul is a bit open-minded to having people do whatever they feel like with his music. Mm-hmm. And you also you also know this from all the remixes that have been done with his stuff. Mm-hmm. So uh, oh, I think I, I think I think it was more of an experiment. Actually, I don't think it was. I thought I thought he wanted to just throw it out there and see what the reaction would be. Um, I don't think he I don't think he really knew what what people were going to say, and the reaction I mean was pretty strong, and a lot of it was very negative. So I don't know. It'd be interesting to see if he continues that. We shall see. All we right. See. One final question, since we touched on this a bit here <laughs> in, in this in this show. Since we were talking about Wings, do you honestly think of them as a group effort, or will you always think that it's Paul and his backup band? Because, like we've been saying, he did make a sincere effort for members of the group to have their time on stage, even to be interviewed. So it wasn't as if, from the very beginning, he said... This is my band. It's all my songs because it wasn't that way. So, Alan, how about you? Well, I, I think I already spent considerable time waffling about that. I'm not sure I can come <laughs> up with, a, <laughs> with an, any more definitive answer. Uh, you know, you want to think of it as a band, but you know that it basically was Paul and a bunch of employees, really, who he allowed to sing a song each and. Uh, but basically it was his show, which it was going to have to be no matter what. I think they tried mm-hmm. to make it into a band. Uh, you know, I, I think I think he wanted it to be a band at, at some point, you know, um, but he also wanted it to be the way he wanted it. So it was a band, but it wasn't a democracy, you know, and mm-hmm. 
I think in the end it was something less than a band in the way that the Beatles or Led Zeppelin or the Stones are a band. Mm. Okay. Al? Al? have to agree with Alan to a great extent, but uh, if there is a period in the Wings saga where they at least gave the, the, the illusion of being a band as such, it would be that period in 75 and 76, the version of the band with, with, uh, with Denny Lane and Jimmy McCulloch and Joe English, and perhaps even before, before him, Jeff Britton. That version of the band that was really the the one that gave at least the the illusion of being a real functioning band uh before that and even the version with Lawrence Juber and Steve Holly with all due respect to to those two heavyweights mm-hmm. to musical heavyweights that version of Wings was definitely simply a backup band for Paul you know they were not a band well, which was why, know. which was why he was able to jettison them so so easily after the uh, the Japan bust and and all. Well, I know for a fact you won't get Lawrence Juber to, to agree with what you just said. Mm, that's course, true. Of course, he, of course. You know, he would. based on based on a lot of things that he said about all of his contributions, Lawrence's contributions to the songs on Back to the Egg, in mm-hmm. particular, you know, Lawrence wouldn't agree with that. Okay, Steve, how about you? I, I think they're actually probably a little more of a group than um, than Al and Alan do. Uh, I, I agree that there was a lot. Of, I mean, Paul basically, you know, a lot of his uh, his uh, musicians are musicians for hire. Um, but um, I think it's a it, it, looking back. I don't know if you could have said this back then, but. I think now you you have to agree that Wings was was uh, more of a band than probably than um, I don't know. It wasn't like I'm trying to think of an example, uh, such and such, and the and the rim tones or whatever. I don't know, but I mean it wasn't it wasn't like that. It definitely wasn't like that. I do think that the current group is more of a, is more of a band than some of his other bands. I think. You know, he. I think he's got a lot of trust in them now. I mean, it's funny. I was again watching some of the old DVDs. You know, those guys never talk, uh, never, never introduce songs, unlike Denny Lane and, introducing. And, and and in fact, Paul doesn't even introduce them anymore. He just says at the end of the show, he says, "And uh, and isn't this a great band?" Right. Mm-hmm. And that's right. it. He doesn't introduce them. Right. Which is kind you know, of kind which of is thing. which for that one person that is seeing him for the first time, they might like to know who those guys on stage are. Yeah, you know? I, I that's so, kind of weird. That he so that's that. certainly not a band, you know. In in that respect, it's just simply they're you know they're his his hired backups. Mm. Now I, I I think that they put in enough effort uh, that that uh, you have to give them a little more than that. Um, well, yeah. As, I mean, much, oh, I mean, they're very, they're very, the they're, they're very they're, professional, right? They're very, they're very professional, and they do their job well. But they're not, you know, they, they don't even give the illusion of being a, you know, of being sort of equals to him. They're simply up there to back him up. Well, I, I think there's no way they can be equals to him. I mean, that's sure. just not. That's just not going to happen, right? But I mean, he even gave. But but like Ken's point was that the or or Alan's point, I think more so was that in the mid, you know, the mid seventies, Paul gave the illusion that Wings was more of a functioning band. Mm -hmm. I would never use. I would never use the word illusion. I think that that's that you're misappropriating. Mm-hmm. Oh that. right, yeah. No, no. It was but, really more Alan and Alan and my, yeah. uh, you know, opinion. But this, but this band, you know, they're simply, you know, they're simply his backup band. Which and there's nothing wrong with it, but mm. uh, but they're not, you know, they're not, you know, they shouldn't be compared, say, to Wings because they're not, you know, there's not even the, you know, the thought of them being a really a real band. I mean, they've hardly even been on any of his records, you know, just to a very, except for the last album, except for New, uh, they've hardly been on any of his records since they began backing him up. 
And that's been mm. 15, almost 15 years. And that says something right there. I mean, they were on half yeah. of memory almost full. I'm trying to remember about Chaos and Creation. There's only a few of them, I think, that played on Chaos and Creation and not on every song. Right. So and there's, there's <clears throat> a huge difference right there. I do think that Paul deserves credit for trying to establish Wings as a band. And I think he really did try, not only on his albums, and, and I can't overemphasize Wings to the Speed of Sound enough, because to have every member sing lead doesn't happen that often, you know, aside from the Beatles. How many other groups can you think of where every member took a lead vocal? So to do that, that was very consciously done. It wasn't just an accident. And um, the mere fact that if you went to the Wings Over America tour, you had five songs that Denny Lane sang lead to. Five that's that's actually quite a lot, I think. Mm -hmm. And then Jimmy McCullough got uh, got Medicine Jar in there, so I really think that he wanted Wings to be established as a band. But what happened was, the fourth and fifth members kept leaving, <laughs> so that really made it difficult to keep the same lineup, and you know to to really um, you know define the same group of people as a band. And I think once Jimmy and Joe left the air went out of the bag, mm -hmm. sort of, in a way. And then Paul would have to pick up the pieces again and then get another fourth and fifth member. And I do love that last lineup, Lawrence and Steve. I think they're tremendous musicians. And oh, that's yeah. another band mm -hmm. I would have loved to have seen that lineup continue. In fact, um, you know, I'm listening back to an interview I did several years ago with Denny Lane talking about it was very frustrating to see that once they were really getting into that last lineup of Wings and they were getting better and better as a band and getting better live, then the breakup happened. So it's like he's building up the bands, they're doing a great job, and then something happens and the fourth and fifth members leave. So because of that, it made it very difficult. There was no consistency with the same lineup for a long period of time. You know, at least when you're talking about a band like, say, Fleetwood Mac, once you have those five members that you know of as Fleetwood Mac, they stay that way for a long time. It wasn't like that with Wings. Mm, and mm. I'm not sure if Fleetwood Mac is the best example. Well, I, mean, I think that, when most people think of Fleetwood Mac, they think of the, the rumors, you know, well, Fleetwood yeah. Mac. Yeah. But, um, and, and so people tend to think of that. Well, you know, they all made a massive contribution to the group and had many lead vocalists, and they, many of them wrote their own songs as you well know. Yeah. So more like that, that's that's more of a band, the Eagles, you know, with more input right. in terms sure. of songwriting and all that. There was some of that in Wings. In fact, when you get to London Town, there's five songs that Paul and Denny wrote together. So there was a lot, there was a lot there in the work relationship, but not enough and not consistently enough for a long period of time to have this hardened image of what Wings is. And also, one other thing that people tend to overlook is that every hit song that Wings had was the Paul vocal. So, you know, if you had Denny Lane with Time to Hide being a hit, <laughs> you know, people might have had a different impression of the group. Or if Medicine Jar was a hit, you know, a hit single, something like that. But they were all Paul hits. They were all Paul vocals and Paul's compositions. So it certainly appeared as though it was Paul's band. But Paul really tried to make Wings work and to give attention to all the members. And I think he deserves a lot of attention for it, but for, you know, for these reasons, I think that, uh, you know, Wings didn't work out the way that, that Paul wanted it to. And once the 80s came into play and he was starting to work on McCartney 2, it was time to let it go. So um, that's my impression of Wings. I don't know if you guys agree. Hello? Um, I, I don't, I don't... <laughs> We were all, we were all so intently listening. Um, I, I I still don't see. I mean, I, like I said, I think Wings was a was a group, but I think you know you'd almost have to put quotation marks around that um, to a certain extent because of just just because of who Paul is. I mean, there's a, I mean, can we ever envision Paul working equally with a band? You know, like in a band like that, unless it was you know. Unless he formed a traveling Wolverines thing, and even then, he probably wouldn't have done that. That would have been an interesting, interesting situation if he had tried to do that. Well, mm -hmm. except that he he didn't really travel in like musical circles in the way that that either John or certainly George did. 
you know, like I said mm-hmm. earlier, you know, the guys in in the traveling mulberries were all personal friends of of uh, uh, right. of, of George's. I mean, Roy Orbison going all the way back to the one of the first Beatles tours, right? You know, <clears throat> you know, whereas yeah, we pretty, I mean, yeah, we pretty much yeah, you know, you're yeah. Right. Whereas you know, the really Paul didn't really have any kind of like peers that he really kind of hung out with. Mm-hmm. Well. Well, that's that's part of the problem. If you're in a band with Paul McCartney, most people are going to think that he's the leader, no matter what, no matter who you mm-hmm. have in the group. Yeah. So you have that inherent problem when you're when you're forming a group like that. So. Right. When Bob Dylan is in your group, you're not gonna you're not gonna take on airs and say I'm the leader of the group. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, he tried it a little with Rockestra in a way. He had Pete Townsend. Yeah. And John Bonham. That's true. And, um, and he did work with Elvis Costello, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know who he would, maybe this could be another show. Well, didn't we do a show that was a little bit about- We did, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought I was there. Okay. All right, we covered a lot of ground here on the show this time out. So, if any of you would like to get in contact with us, we do have an email address. It's things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. We have our own Facebook page at uh, Things We Said Today. We have our own Twitter account, which I never remember. Steve? Things We Said Fab. Okay. With the ad sign in front of it. And if people want to get in touch with you, Steve, they can do so. How? Email me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. I have a, a personal Facebook page. I have a Beatles news group called Beatles News and Commentary that you're all welcome to join. And we can talk about anything and everything regarding the Beatles and, uh, you know, what's happening every day. And, um, and that's where you can catch me. Okay. Al, how about you? Uh, Facebook uh, at Al Sussman, where I don't do anything personal. I just do uh, because uh, there's too many nuts on uh, Facebook. Same with Twitter. And Twitter is uh, at A-S-U-S-S-4-9. Uh, or you can... Contact me through Beetle Fan Magazine, www.beetlefan.com, or www.paradingpress.com. And Alan? Um, probably you? also through the dreaded social media. Um, Facebook, <laughs> send me a you know, Facebook message um, at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And uh, yeah, that's I, I see those pretty regularly. And as for me, Ken Michaels... My email address is everylittlething at att.net. I also have a Facebook page under Ken Michaels, and I have my own website, kenmichaelsradio.com, which has Beatles trivia every single week, and I do have a brand new special contest, which, as this gets posted, will soon be starting, and that's to win three CDs from a gentleman that all of us are familiar with, and that's Jeff Slate, who has just put out a brand new CD called uh, Secret Poetry. He's worked with a lot of people connected with the Beatles, and on the new CD, he's got, well, we just mentioned, Lawrence Juber and Steve Holly on there, also Mm -hmm. members of Elephant's Memory, uh, Gary Van Syok and Anna Mippolito, and uh, I have his three most recent CDs, which you can win, all in one package, a triple shot of Jeff Slate CDs. Find out how at KenMichaelsRadio.com. All right, this has been fun, all this talk about wings. And uh, thanks so much for joining us for Things We Said Today. Uh, This is Ken Michaels being joined by Steve Marinucci, Al Sussman, and Alan Cozen. Thanking all of you for listening, and we will see you next time.